No topic in the world of Rolex elicits more interest, emotion, and yes, angst than buying a Rolex watch. Now at Watchbox, we see hundreds of Rolex watches every year, and between us, mostly you, but some me, <laughs> we've got about 50 years of watch buying experience. How do you avoid the pitfalls that come with buying a Rolex in the current market? Let's talk about broad brush issues, strategic, buying the seller and knowing your watch. Well, to start with, Rolex is such a broad category. So now, God willing, yes, I've been doing this a long time, and it's much easier today because of the internet, because you can go on sites, but you really need to know what you're looking for. You know, if you're looking for a modern sub, or if you're looking for a GMT, you know, which kind of series, which value you're looking for, where do you want to be in that watch? Because if you go in blind, you might miss some of the variations made over the years, some of the upgrades, but if you really take a little bit of time to understand what exactly I'm looking for, I'm looking for a sub in this period, at this age, um, and then you can really narrow down what you're looking at. Now, I think it's important to realize that there really are two different levels of shopping. You've got to shop first really for uh, a seller before you can buy a watch. And I think buying the seller is one of the big picture strategic decisions you have to make. Google is your friend, of course. Let's talk a bit about that. Well, Google is your friend for sure. There's so much information out there. But to your point, it's all about the sellers. There are a number of guys who have been doing this for decades. Um, and again, you wouldn't be in business for decades if you were doing things that you know, were a little bit off kilter. So I really like the fact that you deal with an established seller, somebody who's got history. Uh, you do have a lot of guys who are what I'm going to call fly-by-night. You've seen it, especially in the last two or three years, where the market was escalating so quickly that a lot of people who you know, started as collectors became sellers and then became dealers. Um, and they really don't have the history, they don't have the tradition, they don't have the reliability that they're gonna be there in a year or two if something happens or if there's an issue. So knowing the seller, knowing their reputation, knowing the credibility behind it, super important. Now, a couple of things to look for in general are longevity. How long has the person been in the game? You also wanna see if the seller has a freestanding website. It's a relatively small threshold of effort, but if the seller only exists on Chrono24 or eBay, then the seller has a minimal footprint and critically, less skin in the game. Now let's also talk about an issue which is feedback. Everyone gets a bad review at some point. I think a seller <laughs> deserves a chance to explain that. But when you've got a repeating track record of bad reviews, I think that's when you have to really have uh, your radar up and your awareness out. Well, there's no question about it. And the review process is great. And that's one of the things I always encourage my clients, whoever you're buying from, if you've had a great experience, you know, support the community help people understand that it's important as a good review, if somebody's responsive and done a great job, you should share that, uh, as well as the negative experience. Now, obviously, most people tend to share the negative quicker than the positive. So to your point, there's always a review or two that are you know, not great, but there's a big difference between somebody not responding quickly or a package having an issue than as somebody got something and there was a problem and didn't respond. Yeah, I think the biggest problems are always when someone gets a watch and then the seller refuses to handle whatever follow-up complaint or issue or complication Correct. might arise. And that sort of brings me to another really important point about buying a watch, mostly online, because I think that's where a lot of watch shopping is done today. And that is the right to return the watch. When you are shopping online, by definition, you have not seen the watch in the flesh. Sales that are as is, no warranty, no return, you really need to just avoid that because that's someone who's trying to cover their blind side. They don't know what they're selling or they don't know it's authentic or they know it's bad. Well, a lot of times that was always the way the internet kind of started and it was one of the complaints people had about eBay for a lot of years was, you know, you'd ended up with a lot of things that were iffy on that platform and other dealers had the same issues. So to your point, knowing what it is and being able to return it after a week. And, and for a refund, that's the other thing is, you know, you'll get a lot of guys who say, oh, you can return it, but you have to buy something else. Well, that's not really a that's return an policy. That's an exchange, that is not a return. Return policies are standard of any reputable dealer today, and it's something you have to insist on. And I think we need to be clear about what we mean by return policy. If you don't like the watch, you can return it. Not if it comes and it's broken, or it's inauthentic, or if for whatever reason, 
it doesn't fit or some guy says that the bezel is incorrect, you need to be ready to take a watch back if the person doesn't like it. Questions never asked, just can you send it back to me? Can you insure it? Will you return it intact? If yes, then the watch needs to be returnable. You can't try a watch on through the screen. <laughs> As much as people have tried all these tricks. And frankly, you can't tell whether a vintage watch you're buying is a Franken watch built from parts or whether the movement is poorly serviced and has low amplitude. Those are things an expert can tell in person, but if you don't have some sort of right of return, even if you've got the foremost Rolex expert in the world at your disposal, when you take delivery of the watch, you're stuck with it. Being able to show the watch to an expert when you receive it and then decide is really key, especially with older, more specialized models. Well, especially with the vintage things. It's a whole, it's much, much more difficult to buy vintage. There are a lot of things that have happened over the years that are iffy, and there's fewer and fewer out there. One of the other things I often tell people is, if it seems too good to be true, it probably is, because there are so many things that have been Frankensteined or modified in some way or changed over the years, and someone puts it on at a very low price just to move it out, but you're not really getting great value just because it's a cheap price. Yeah, the return policy is your insurance policy with, with online sales. I think it's also important to remember that a lot of times the most specialized watches really require the most specialized sellers. Like, I'll be honest, I'm not the guy to tell you whether a 5510 Explorer dial is redialed or original. I'm not the guy to tell you whether a 33460 graph has been assembled from parts. I'm just not that guy. And there are sellers who specialize in this kind of Rolex. And I say seek them out if you're looking for that kind of Rolex. Well, I think that's a great point because the market is very segmented. There are dealers who specialize in more modern, um, and then there are guys who are really niche players uh, in the vintage world, even down to model-specific levels. And I think that is important to at least seek them out um, and to have a conversation. I think a lot of people think of internet shopping as click and buy, but it's really not today. You really wanna have a conversation. I would never buy an expensive watch without talking to the man or the person behind it to know that they're comfortable speaking to it, that they're gonna give me some assurances and that they really are truly an expert and not somebody who's just posting a lot of pictures. And you can really tell the difference because the real experts have references, they have track records, uh, they have extensive galleries sometimes on their website of watches they've sold and people with real names and phone numbers and emails you can <laughs> contact. And that is key with sellers. You want to see references that are not just, Bob in Cincinnati, I got a great watch, thanks. That doesn't help. Bob may or may not exist. Right, and Bob may disappear in two weeks when you have a problem with the watch. And that's the thing, you wanna have some credibility behind it. And again, these people who have been doing this for decades, um, I count myself as one of them. I mean, I've been hanging around in the business forever. And I know most of the major players that have been over the years, and 99% of them are excellent. But it's always the few bad apples that cause the problems and make things complicated when you're shopping online. Yeah, and this is absolutely essential. I also think that it's important to remember that you need to pick the right horse for the right course. At Watchbox, for example, I'd say late model pre-owned, like 1990 to the present, is the meat of our market with absolutely. Rolex. And I think a good thing about that is that we have particular expertise in that era of Rolex. We're gonna know if that magnetic strip card belongs in the box based on the age of the watch. We're gonna know if it should have the 2020 update card. We know exactly what should be included with a 1995 day date. Like we're very sophisticated at that level. And if you wanna go deep into the past, you're gonna probably look for a guy who does far less volume and focuses just in many cases on one model. Like there are people who are the experts on the GMT, the expert on the Daytonas and pre-Daytonas, the experts on 1950s no crown guard submariners. And that's really, I think, where you need to not just buy your seller, but also understand what expertise you need in order to make your purchase. Yes, and you do need that expertise. And to your point, that is exactly what we're great at. We're a big, large volume, but mostly modern. Yeah. Um, in the last 25, 30 years is really where our sweet spot is. Um, because honestly, that's where the volume is. It's very hard to build a big business around these niche models. That's why you'll often find, you know, kind of one man shows a little bit on the smaller, but those are the people that are very reachable or very personable, and you should be able to have a contact and a relationship with them. And the other thing I always tell people is buy quality. You're not gonna get a bargain buying a Rolex. 
that Rolex is not about a price shopping thing. Yes, you can pay a fair price, but if something is inexpensive when you're buying it, there's usually a reason. And if you'll pay up a little bit more for a top quality piece with a full set and every assurance there is all together, and you pay a few points extra, it is far worth it over the long term to really invest. If it's something you plan on keeping for a long time, the best pieces always hold value better. Um, whenever you buy things that are a little cheaper, long term they're always cheaper. And I think that sort of brings us to the last sort of phase of our strategic approach to buying the watches, like the big picture, broad brush stuff to avoid a bad watch or a bad seller. And that's making yourself an expert. Now you talk about online resources. Rolex is the most documented watch brand in the history of the world. Everything you need to know on most mainstream models is online somewhere, whether it's websites of specialists who focus on one model or mm -hmm. one era, whether it's auction catalogs that catalog the obscure stuff, journalists who've written articles about releases made in the last 20 years, full set photos of watches that were complete so you know what should come with the watch you want. Again, Google is your friend, but don't undersell books. Books. I was just gonna, you took the words out of my mouth. There are so many great books on Rolex. And the depth that you'll get into a book and the enjoyment you get. I mean, yeah, Google's great and I love reading online, but there's something tactical about a book when you're really interested in that subject and dive into it. It's the best investment you'll ever make. Particularly with some of the large hardcover multi-volume references, that is its own kind of Rolex investment. That will have lasting value, just like a Zenith era Daytona will have lasting value, just as a pre-crown guard sub with original dial, original movement will have lasting value, or an old rivet bracelet. Those books that you buy by the real authorities, those have lasting value. And again, I have a lot of friends, and I have them myself, that they sit out in my house. And I find myself every once in a while just randomly picking it up and flipping through it where I might not go onto Google, but the book's there in front of me, it triggers an emotion, and you, you tend to dive into it again. So I love having the books around. On that count, sometimes you also want to use the latest references. Books are very traditional, but the wisdom of crowds is not to be not denied. If you're looking at a watch to buy, post a picture, post a link to the listing, use the most knowledgeable people on forums online to review the purchase before you make the deal. I love that idea. And the chat groups have really blown up now, even beyond the forums. There are so many great chat groups that I'm in on Rolex, specifically down to a model level, that you'll really get a lot of people who are passionate expertise and use their knowledge. Now, at the tactical level, actually closing the deal and, and making the purchase, the first thing I want to remind you is that with any modern day Rolex, We've known for at least 20 years, thanks to the internet, that a modern watch needs to have its boxes and its papers included. If not, that means slipshod ownership, that means someone's trying to pull a fast one. At the very least, it means a discount that will not be worth it in the long run, because a Rolex is a long-term purchase. Yeah, papers especially is my big pet peeve, um, because the warranty card, or be it the papers, whatever the period-specific piece is, really helps give credibility to that watch and gives you some assurance that it was manufactured as it says. Now the boxes, a lot of dealers, especially internationally, don't transport the boxes around. So the boxes will be there or not, but they're always replaceable. Uh, even the vintage ones, if you're willing to spend a little bit of money, you can get the box. But the papers are not replaceable. So that's something for sure I would insist on. Particularly when the box is distinctive in some way. I mean, if we're talking about the vintage King Midas, it came with this wonderfully Hellenic Fantastic. theme. Oh my gosh, that, <laughs> that was the original boxed set, like the themed boxed set. The watch is worth a lot more if you have that. But in the modern era, you have to remember that there are millions of identical Rolex watches. Nothing to tell them apart except the standard of care they've received from their owners and the completeness of their box papers and accessories. And I would just say, if you're looking at a watch that's less than 30 years old, and it doesn't have at least the warranty document, just skip it. For sure, I agree with that. But I also love, like, there's nothing more fun when you open it up and you find someone who's got the original plastic guard, the hang tags, the, the chronometer certificate, the anchor. I love anchors. Uh, that stuff just makes the whole package much more special. You know, on the sea dwellers and the subs, they used to come with these lovely little anchors and into the modern era, like they continued to do this and they're wonderful. And yeah, you can rebuild the box set if you want, but that's gonna cost you a pretty penny on eBay. It really will. And there's just something knowing that somebody cared about it so much, there's a certain 
respect that someone has given that watch when they have that full set. And I think you feel that. I know you feel that way. I feel the same way. I know certain clients, when I get their piece in, it's just going to be a certain way. And I'm going to love to get their watch because I know the care they give it. And also, there's the box, the papers, and then there's more. The box plus, I would call it. As a watch ages, there should be evidence of service by a competent authority. Uh, particularly with more complicated watches like the Yachtmaster 2, you want to see that it's received attention in the last half decade at least. A lot of times the invoice from the original selling dealer mm -hmm. or the bill of sale, that's something you want to see in a modern era watch. It's not normal to just throw that out if you ever want to get value back for your watch. So things like documentation from the original selling dealer, not just the Rolex parts, but also evidence of what the dealer did at the local level. And sometimes if the watch is said to be historically important, or one owner since the 1960s, something that's historic and has long-term value tied to a person or a place, you want to see a period photo of the alleged owner wearing that watch. That's a dream, all those things together. But really, if you're talking collectability, for sure. And I think it goes back to the, the car industry really set that up. Where you, when you buy a vintage car, oftentimes you'll get the book yes. that shows all the service history and the care and attention it's gotten. And now that is starting to move into the watch business. Sure. Particularly with watches made, I would say, 30 to 50 years ago, where you have a really good chance of the watch going back to Rolex and coming back with service paperwork, all of a sudden that service paperwork is the imprimatur of the brand. Like it went through Rolex, right. they were comfortable with this combination of parts, felt it was period correct, model correct, unit correct, and it came back from them intact with a warranty document. Even if that warranty has lapsed, the fact that it went through Rolex and they approve the watch as you're buying it is a huge deal and that is not part of the original box set that is subsequent documentation correct and that gives you that credibility and knowing that it's hundred percent right we love to see service papers come through now I would also say this it's important to remember that you need to know if a person has the watch claimed there are a lot of Rolex photos out there and this is just a small point, but just to see whether the person has the watch claimed, ask them to set the watch to some random time, like 537 on the 13th. <laughs> Don't laugh. This is important. You see a lot of generic photos out there. Yeah, everything's at 1010, for sure. Uh, even our watches are often at 1010, but absolutely, being able to set it, having a video, I mean, a video clip. And the thing I always hear from people is like, oh, though they couldn't do pictures, they wouldn't do this. It's like, if... Taking a video and a picture today is as easy as picking up your phone and sending it over. So it really shouldn't be a complication. Without a doubt, photos and video are key. And you should immediately discount any ad that doesn't include good photos. Or at the very least, if the seller doesn't follow up on your request for good photos. Because today, good photos are everything in portrayal of a watch. And refusing to portray a watch clearly is dissembling or it's gross incompetence. I can't take a good photo with a 4K camera phone. <laughs> you, need, you need a new job, exactly. You're in the wrong business. <laughs> so don't undersell photos and also video today. It's increasingly easy to just send a 60 second video by text. Exactly, and that just gives you the credibility. You can see the, the bracelet. You know, a lot of times you'll see either stock photos or just headshot photos as I call them. And the bracelets are really in a lot of cases where you see the quality diminish over time. Because some people are just rough with them, bracelets get beat up, they didn't hold up as well as the new modern bracelets do. So the condition of the bracelet is super important and you really only pick that up in a video. Also really important is to take a look at the financial institutions being nominated to receive the money. Is the bank in the same country as the seller claims to be? Is the bank in Eastern Europe? Is it in a conflict zone? Is it in a place where crime is known to be rife or there's political turmoil and unrest? I remember a couple years back at Watch You Want, which was kind of like the ancestor of Watchbox, we had someone who was, it was the other way, they were trying to buy a watch and the emails were coming from Crimea in the middle of the invasion <laughs> of Crimea and the proof of basically the person's means to pay was a picture of a pile of cash on a table. <laughs> And, and you didn't have confidence in that. We're, we're, we're like, you know what? I, I don't think we're going to go. We're, not just, we're just not down for the terms of sale here. <laughs> Look for the opposite of that. If you know that the watch is being advertised in a war zone mm. or in an area where fraud is known to be rife. Probably not where you want to be. Exactly. That is an obvious risk factor to avoid. 
Yeah, and I think also the nice thing about the Rolex market is it is so broad. So you really aren't going to have to deal with something like that. You can be particular in every sense of the, the purchase process. You really should be particular who you're dealing with, the quality you're getting, and mitigating any of those risks. And I also think it's important that you make yourself an expert on the watch you want to buy because there are changes. Rolex has a reputation for being very consistent, but the changes on a Rolex, though subtle, are often of huge importance to collectors. Knowing what should be in the box, knowing which model of the watch is the best match for you, uh, knowing how to evaluate a watch on its own terms. Like you use different criteria to evaluate the condition of a vintage watch than you do a modern watch. Patina is okay on a vintage watch. Damage is not. Patina is okay on a vintage watch. It's not okay on a modern watch. And you'll also see these, these variations of, you know, Explorer 2s. You know, it was made for a long time, but you'll see the variations where the, the whole case had holes. The case has an engraved serial number, the case is a solid end piece bracelet. There's a lot of little variations that happened over the years, which didn't change the reference number at all, but definitely changes the value of the watch over time. It also lets you know not to pay too much for something that a seller is making out to be this monumental dial variation or bezel variation or hand variation. Look, not every bezel is a radium loomed Bakelite GMT. Like there are some dial variants in the world of Rolex that are nothing more than bookkeeping changes. Oh, the index changed a little, okay. They can come up with a cute name for it, they could sell right. it however they like, but most of the changes made are not the ones that force you to pull out the pocketbook. And you'll know when you're looking at those because there are no secrets. Everyone knows everything about Rolex today on the internet. <laughs> Plus, if someone has like a 9315 bracelet on a 1962 sub and they're like, oh yeah, all original, all original. Well, you're like, okay, well that doesn't make any sense because that bracelet didn't exist back then. It may look right because it's an oyster bracelet on a Submariner, but it's wrong. And knowing these details, some of which are just down to serial number or, or reference number, uh, they make a big difference in the watch you buy. Without a doubt. And they, again, through the years, even Rolex at times would update pieces that went in for service. So finding one that's completely original um, has challenges sometimes. So you do have to pay attention to detail in everything in the Rolex world because it's so broad, there's so many variations, um, and things do get changed over time. So getting that original piece without a service dial, without a replaced bracelet, uh, definitely changes the value than something that's been updated or changed or the hands have been changed over the time. Uh, these are a lot of little things that you'll find on watches that will affect the value greatly. And there are some changes that do alter the usability or functionality of the watch. Uh, some examples of which would be this year's Deep Sea. It lost the flip out dive extension. If that's important to you, don't buy this year's Deep Sea. And there have been a lot of changes like that over the years where the watch has fundamentally been altered and the difference is maybe one digit in the reference number. Yes, and, and again, the difference between changes in a model that don't make a reference change and the reference change changes are very different. The reference changes are easy to find because you can map that out, but there are a lot of variations over models that didn't go to the reference change level in Rolex's book. I don't know what exactly does that all the time, but we're learning now they, they're more apt to change reference numbers. To your point, the deep sea, this is our third reference number for the deep sea. And then there are models like the Blueberry GMTs of the 1970s. Were they factory? Were they created by regional Rolex service offices? You need to do a lot of research before you're comfortable buying a watch like that because even if you have one that was converted by a Rolex regional service office, uh, if you think this is a factory bezel, you might wind up being sorely disappointed. Yeah, no, that's a very interesting watch and a very controversial watch because you've gotten different stories and we've never really gotten the 100% you know, solid answer on that. And there's still a lot of education to be done, even at our level, uh, on pieces like that, which is, makes it kind of fun too. Which means sometimes you have to be confident with uncertainty. Uh, you know, things like the blueberry bezels, things like a transition year when half the dials were made in tritium, half the dials were made in Luminova. How do you ever really know for sure? The white gold blue dial GMT that lasted for one year in 2018, is it factory fitted or is, or is it, it retrofitted? Fitted, right? There are questions like that. You need to know that sometimes you're not ever going to be able to get a definitive answer. So before you make that purchase, you have to be comfortable with a degree of uncertainty. Yeah, and again, to your point from the beginning, comfortable with who you're getting it from. 
Um, there's certainly much more confidence in dealing with somebody who's been in business for decades and has a large presence and you know is going to be there in five or ten years. If a question ever arose, there's still going to be someone there to stand behind it. Yeah, I mean, th there's no doubt. Over the years, there have been people who are highly specialized. Massimo Baraka, Matthew Bain, Eric Koo, James Lambden. Eric Wind, people who really know what they're doing. And I think all of the good guys in this business are pretty well known. And the experts are also pretty well known. If you've got some dude looking to sell a day chest that he won in a sales competition and it's a brand new model of your watch with a warranty intact, you're probably fine. <laughs> if you're looking to buy a 6062 star dial with unpolished case and immaculate dial, be a bit more skeptical and know your seller. Yes, for sure. Those are going to end up only in certain hands. That's just the way the market works. Um, but it's a fun market and it's much easier today. So there's really no reason not to do your homework. Uh, and part of the fun of shopping to me is doing that homework. I do the same thing when I'm buying a car. I'm on, you know, yeah. once a week, twice a week, looking at everything that pops up. Auto trader, Auto, classic exactly. trader, car bring a trailer. <laughs> exactly, love bring a trailer. Uh, that's the fun of the hunt. Um, and then finding that right one that will fall into your lap eventually. The more you research, the more you search, the more experiences that you associate with the process of reaching that Rolex Gold Watch, whatever it might be, you start to build a well of memories that you associate with that watch even before it lands in your collection. I've always said that finding lasting satisfaction with a watch means you need to somehow elevate a mere purchase to the level of an experience that you associate with memories and emotions. When you do that, regardless of which Rolex watch you seek, you'll find lasting satisfaction with the choice you make. And that's our episode and our lap around the crown. <laughs>